like a formation. This is to help, uh, if a blast happens, it's not going to cause so much damage moving on the line. So if you've got it out in front of you, uh, the guy in front probably doesn't really like you very much, uh, and the guy behind you probably doesn't really like you either. Equally, if you have it up in the air, you're moving around, you are just giving away your position. So it actually didn't really prove that useful for that respect. Now I did say they were the first chaps in the party, but not necessarily the first people to do anything. Um, they would be the second group behind them, uh, and they're the grenadiers. And they're armed with 40, uh, 14 of these. This is the number five, the Mills bomb, a hand grenade. Uh, they would have 14 strapped around their body on a bandolier. Now, I'm a bit of a lover of movies, ladies and gentlemen. I do like my films. And I love it in the films when you see the chap with the grenade. He always is the hero with the grenade. He grabs it with his teeth, pulls it out, and slings it over uh, rather heroically. Actually, if he did that, he'd probably end up leaving his dentures behind. Um, <laughs> it it's probably not advisable. Um, I suggest getting a nice firm grip, pulling this, and pulling it out. Now, if I'm holding it like I am now, absolutely nothing will happen until I let go. When I let go, there's a little lever up here on the top. That springs up. It drops a plunger down onto the detonator, and then I want to get rid of it, uh, and hopefully rather quickly. At the beginning of the war, you had about seven seconds to get rid of this. That actually proved a little bit too long. Soldiers were throwing it, the Germans were picking it up, and throwing it back. <laughs> so then they discover a technique of, uh, a couple of soldiers have read a lot of reports where they cook the grenade. And by this I mean you pull it, you hold it, and you count. One, two, three, yeah, and then you chuck it. Again, counting style do differ if you're nervous. Yeah, it's not the best way to do it. So they do shorten this uh, to about three seconds uh, by the end of the war, and it proved a lot more successful for that. Now, I've heard quite a lot of myths about this, and, and usually about its kind of iconic pineapple shape. Some of the original documentation I've seen uh, says that this was there to aid fragmentation. I don't think this is supposed to mean that when it blows up, little bits go flying off in, in little areas. That's not really the case. Um, this is a bomb, ladies and gentlemen. It'll blow up anyway it wants to. It'll go along stress lines on the metal. Essentially, this is there for grip. If you're in a waterlogged boggy trench and this is a nice smooth ball, you drop it to your feet, it lands in a puddle, yeah, you're going to be struggling rather quickly after that. Um, it's, it's like I say, it's there to help you hold it. So, they're the second guys in the party. Uh, they need a bit of backup and help with the third guys in the party. Uh, they're called the carriers. Now, these two chaps, they have got a bit of an unfortunate job of it. They're holding a box of 40 of these uh, hand grenades, and they've got to carry it up out of their trench and across no man's land. It sounds pretty easy, but when you consider that's going to weigh about maybe two stone, You've got to lift that and carry it across waterlogged, foggy, entrenched conditions. There might be shell holes, huge blasts in the ground, maybe barbed wire. It's not really a job that I'd want to do, to be honest with you. But then saying that, the, the last guys in the party, they've probably got the most unfortunate job of it all. Uh, the last ones are called the spare men. Now they're spare in case anybody doesn't make it so far, they would just step in and take their position. But they also have a bit of a job themselves. Uh, they might be armed with something like this. Well, this is an entrenching tool, um, pretty much standard kit. This is what you're going to get to dig things like trenches and holes in the first place. But in the trench raid, uh, one of their jobs was to take their entrenching tool and, and once they managed to get into the enemy trench, say they were being shot at, uh, they had to create a barrier between themselves and the enemy. And the way they decided to do this was to dig sandbags and make a sandbag wall between themselves and the enemy. Not sure I want to do that, to be honest with you. If I'm getting shot at, the last thing I want to do is to start digging a spade full of sandbags. Um, the chances are very likely this is going to be used as a hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon. Um, they would sharpen the end of this and use it a little bit like an axe. I always think it's kind of strange when we're thinking of this world of kind of modern warfare, machine guns, uh, gas, flamethrowers, that we're still coming down to hitting each other with things like this. As well as this, you might maybe create this yourself, um, if you're interested in trench art, you can see things like this that are very beautifully decorated. Uh, this is a trench club. Uh, based on around us about this one, it's actually been adapted slightly. Um, it's got the nails from the bottom of a hobnail boot stuck in the end of it to give it a bit of extra welly. In the Imperial War Museum, I've seen examples of these that are drilled out and filled full of lead, and equally with barbed wire and spikes on the end of it too. Again, th this idea that, you know, we're supposed to be modern, yet we're hitting each other with sticks seems kind of strange to me. That's the party. They would also be uh, accompanied by their NCO, their non-commissioned officer. Uh, now he doesn't have a specific job in the party. He's there to offer leadership and guidance, uh, maybe moral support, or again to step in if somebody doesn't make it. Um, his inspiration, if you want, to make you go through with it might come in the form of this. Um, this uh, is a Webley, Mark 6 Webley revolver. Um, now I'm not going to 
this one open actually because it has a bit of a problem on it at the moment. Uh, but gradually when you open this out, it has a rather handy little ejection mechanism. Um, it will eject all six 455 caliber rounds pretty much straight away. Um, if you're lucky enough, you might get hold of something like this. This is a circular charger or a speed loader. Um, some people bought them for themselves. Um, you would then just pop that straight in, give it a bit of jiggle, pull it back out again, all your rounds are ready to go. It works on single action and double action. When this I mean, I can pull the trigger uh, and it will rotate the hammer, uh, rotate the cylinder, hit the hammer and your shot will go flying. Or I can manually pull it back and then aim and fire. The second of the two is probably the more accurate um, because it takes less pressure to pull back the trigger. Saying that, it is a pistol. And again in movies, I love the idea that the, the guy with the pistol they always takes a shot from about a mile away and he always hits his target. Um, this is close quarter fighting, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's quite powerful, jumpy round, so you're going to have to be as close as you can really uh, for it to do a lot of damage. Pretty much so about most pistols, really. So that's our raiding party. Um, were they successful? It's hard to answer that question, to be honest with you. Um, there are cases where these raiding parties were incredibly successful. Uh, they gained information like the first gas attacks, um, so they were prepared and ready for them. But then in other instances, uh, the guys going over there don't necessarily speak German, uh, so the stuff they're bringing back might be as useful as maybe a shopping list. Equally, are they going to be likely to bring back an officer? Uh, are you much more likely to bring back the first guy you come across? So the ways and the costs of it I'm not too sure, to be honest. But that's our raiding party. Now I thought while I was at it, I'd bring out a few other countries as well, since so we were talking about the aim of being fair. Um, so I've got a couple of different objects to show you too. Um, in 1917, in December, the Americans joined the war effort. And when they come along, they bring a lot of new equipment and fresh troops. Um, it's kind of the tipping balance, really, uh, in the First World War. So I've brought out a couple of American things. Uh, the American pistol, uh, this is the Colt. Uh, A1 Colt. To use it, it works on a magazine-fed system. Um, it takes seven uh, 4 5 ACP rounds. To use it, it's got this sliding action, so you kind of slide it and it cocks it back. It does have quite a few handy little safety features that I quite like, that are quite modern for this sort of gun. Um, on the back, it's got this little button here. Um, in order for this gun to work once it's cocked, that button has to be suppressed. If I don't have that pushed down, it won't go back. So, you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot, which is rather handy. It also has this little button on the side of the trigger here. Uh, you can just see that on the side. Um, so once I've cocked it, I can clip that up. And even if I push that button and pull the trigger, nothing at all will happen. And so I pull that back down again, pull the trigger, bang, it will go. So again, it's it's quite modern in this safety, trying to keep it safe for you. Um, I think it looks modern too, if we're talking about 1911. Um, it is up there for modern mistakes. And then the next weapon that I've got, uh, this is an 1897 Winchester pump action shotgun. Um, this is actually a civilian hunting model uh, with, a, with a slight adaption to it. Now, one of the things that I often hear when people are looking at this, they always go, there's a double barrel shotgun, because they see it in tubes. That, that's not how it works. Um, this second barrel up here is where you stack up your rounds of a 12 gauge buckshot, it's a cartridge. Inside that cartridge, there'll be lots of little lead balls. Then to use it, you kind of pump this down, print it up into the loading gate, I pull the trigger, and lead balls will spray out the end of the, we of the weapon. If you imagine that in a close confined quarters of a trench, this is absolutely deadly. It earned the nickname of the trench broom or the trench sweeper, because you could literally sweep men out of the way. Um, it has a, a combat trigger on it, so that means that I don't even have to bother pulling the trigger anymore. All I have to do is pump, and every time I do, a spray of shot will go flying. The Germans actually complained about this at the Hague Convention, saying that it was unethical. <laughs> uh, yeah, when you consider they're using flamethrowers and mustard gas, you really have a leg to stand on, okay? uh, Speaking of the Germans, I've got a couple of German weapons too. Um, my movie fan comes out again. The iconic bad guy gun, uh, the, the, the Luger, this is 1908 Luger. Again, I'm fed system in the bottom. Uh, it works on a kind of nasty, horrible toggle grip. It's got this toggle up here on the top, and you wrench that back. Uh, to make it work. I had a real bad tendency of kind of catching fingernails and, and, and getting you stuck and things like this. And that's why I'm not going to do it, because I'm going to be clumsy. I'm pretty sure I'll do that. Then every time you want to fire it, you just pull the trigger and away you go. Um, it's true German engineering, this ladies and gentlemen. It's got lots of tiny little intricate parts, and that's kind of its downfall. In a sort of waterlogged, foggy trench condition, this is going to get full of mud and filth and dirt. It's going to jam up and no longer work. I had a real bad tendency of shooting people in the foot, uh, going off when you didn't really want it to. Again, it's a pistol, so it's kind of close quarter. We're not talking about great distances with this. 
The reality is these sort of weapons are going to be more likely to be used as executioners' tools rather than something in a firefight. The regardless of its faults, it made its way through the First World War and into the Second World War as well, and it's actually quite a prized collector's item uh, for, for treasure hunters, and I think we should quite well for that. And then we come down to the German rifle. This is the Mauser. It's a bolt action rifle, just as before, so lift the bolt back, pull it back. There's no box magazine on this one, it actually has an internal magazine of five, so you don't quite get as many shots as you would get uh, with the 303, but it's perhaps a little bit more accurate and will go a little bit more for, a little bit further. Um, and I suppose, in a nutshell, that's kind of the problem with the First World War. You've got two sides, three sides, with the same sort of equipment, same tactics, same sort of ideas, and for that reason, nobody really moves. In my opinion, the, the tipping of the balance in, in 1918-1917 is when the Americans join fresh troops, fresh ammunition, fresh approach. It kind of pushes it in favour. Um, and with that, we get armistice signed in 1918. Now, you can at this point, I'd go into numbers, ladies and gentlemen. I'd tell you numbers about people who died and things like this. But I actually think you can get stuck in statistics. You can get lost in them, and it doesn't mean anything. So I thought I'd end on something a bit different. Um, I, I'm going to end on a quote uh, by, by a gentleman. Uh, his name's Private Jack Mudd, I rather like his name. He was a, a, a Royal Fusilier, and he actually was a 31-year-old who died at the Battle of Passchendaele. And he wrote this letter to his wife just before that. He says, Out here, dear, we're all pals, but one, one hasn't got, the other has. We try to share each other's troubles, get each other out of danger. See, so you wouldn't believe the humanity between men. It's a lovely thing, this friendship out here. And I thought this time of remembrance, that was a nicer point to end it on than, than death numbers. But regardless of this, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, in a second, I invite you to come and have a closer look at these objects. But I will just say before you jump up um, that most of these are pretty much original on this table. So please treat them with the utmost respect, pretty much like you would order your own granny. Don't turn them around. Um, and we like that. Equally, if you've been in the military and you can strip these weapons down in under two minutes, don't, because they get really crumpy really quickly when you do that. Please don't aim anything at anybody because it's not nice to have a gun in your face. But don't let me put you off. Ask me or Carl a question and we'll be sure to help you out. Thank you. Yeah. 